Simona Dinerstein is a critically acclaimed concert pianist and one of the greats performing today. Celebrated for her originality, thoughtfulness, and curiosity, she is lauded both as a soloist and collaborator. Simona Dinerstein has returned to Winnipeg to once again perform with the Manitoba Chamber Orchestra in Art of the Baroque. She's also returned to the Classic 107 studio and joins me now. Hello. Welcome Hello. back to Winnipeg. It's great to be here. Well, I was thinking about the last time you were in, and it was uh, January, and I think it was warmer on that January afternoon than it is this November morning oh. in town. Yes. Um, we Winnipeggers really do love to to talk about the weather, I guess. Well, it is pretty striking. Yeah, it's, it's very true. Yeah. But I, I do want to talk more about that concert back in 2018. Um, it was a concert that featured the Canadian premiere of, of Philip Glass Piano Concerto No. 3. Um, I was there. It was a, a packed house, a passionate performance of a work written specifically for you. And you went on to perform the work in Germany, France, Italy. You've toured it extensively through the U.S. Um I want to ask you about something that you said in in the interview a few years back. Um, We were chatting about uh, the life of a a touring performer, and you you mentioned rock and roll musicians. I think it was Leonard Cohen and Suzanne performing the same piece over and over again. I'm curious now, what what was it like performing The Glass so regularly for, for more than a year? Oh, well, I am actually continuing to perform it. In fact, I just performed it two weeks ago in Turin, and I believe it was the 37th performance of the piece. Wow. Which is pretty amazing for a new piano concerto that was just premiered in 2017 to have that many performances in two years. And I've done, you know, obviously I've done all of the performances. So um, it is quite interesting to live with the same piece like that for so long. And I have thought about that, um, you know, I've thought about people that, play the same work over and over again. Um, You know, it changes a lot depending on the orchestra that I'm Mm. playing with and the conductor that I'm working with. Sometimes I'm not working with the conductor. I'm just leading it myself. Um, Sometimes orchestras do something that is so kind of unexpected that it, it shows a new aspect of the work to me. Um, And then sometimes orchestras have a tendency to have the same kinds of mannerisms in the same place. And then I'm like, ah, not for the 36th time, you know. (laughs) But it does evolve and it does continue to change then. Your interpretation, orchestra's interpretations, kind of depending on where where you're playing it. Definitely. And, And what's interesting is that oftentimes the conductor will listen to my recording of the piece, which I made um, after, right after the premiere. So I had just played it like, once and then we recorded it and now I play it quite differently and huh. so um so that's interesting because they'll they'll say oh you didn't do it like that in the recording and I'm like well that that was two years ago <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah new year new me yeah. um well I, then that kind of leads to my next question in that you were reunited with the MCO this past summer you were you were performing the the Philip Glass Piano Concerto number no. three with the MCO at Stratford at Stratford Summer Music what, what was it like getting back together to perform it almost like a, a year and a half later uh, that was really lovely, and we actually were we we did a tour, so yeah. I think we did four or five different concerts, and uh, it was nice to live with it with them. I mean, that's always different than doing just one concert. Mm-hmm. Also, to do uh, to perform it in different spaces, acoustical spaces. I think that the glass is extremely affected by acoustics um, because it's a very spacious piece of music. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> How you can play off of an acoustic is is interesting, um, and and they're so sensitive in how they play the Manitoba Chamber Orchestra, and, and also Anne is such a sensitive conductor. So it was, it was really wonderful working with them. Does touring really bring you together in a way that, well, like you just said, a, a one off performance is one thing, but to to tour a work and to keep working with these musicians, uh, day after day or performance after performance, does it really kind of help make it jive at a, a level of cohesion that you you wouldn't otherwise have? I think that it does change the whole experience because you're actually socializing together. And I think that um, orchestras are really sort of mini societies. Mm. And um, and so to become part of their community is great. Sometimes they allow you to become part of their community just by rehearsing with them. And other times, you know, breaking the ice by touring with them is, is even better. 
And here you are, uh, back reunited again just a, a few months later in Winnipeg. Um, they are, like you said, just a, a, a fantastic band. What do you enjoy about collaborating with, with the MCO? Can you, can you speak a little bit further to that? Oh, well, they're... They are a very friendly group of people, which is That's always nice. nice. Yeah, we Manitobans are kind of known for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like musicians. I, I love working with musicians who are interested in in delving into the music in a deeper way, and who are are you know have questions and want to, you know, how how do we do this part or how should we articulate that and. And who make eye contact with me mm-hmm. while we're playing, um, so that it's more of a sense of chamber music. Uh, and so this orchestra, definitely the Manitoba Chamber Orchestra, the I think that's probably part of their kind of value system mm-hmm. is that that's what that's that's what they want to do. So um, they are led by the outstanding Ann Manson. Um, not for this performance, though. Uh, uh, Douglas Boyd will be on the podium. Have Have you guys worked together before at all? Have your paths crossed? Uh, Interestingly, we worked together in Australia. Oh, good, yeah. <laughs> All good things happen down under, yeah. I guess, uh, just right across the world. What, what brought you together there? Uh, we played, um, actually, one of these Bach concertos, the D minor, oh, we no did way. in with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra a number of years ago. I've not seen him um, since then, and I'm looking forward to seeing him again because, actually, he, you know, he's Scottish, mm-hmm. and he... Um, recommended a place for me to go in Scotland for a holiday, and I actually went there. Oh, so wow. <laughs> uh, I need to report back to him. Yeah, as I was going to say, give him, give him the full recap. Yeah. Um, he, uh, for listeners, uh, one of the founding members of, of the Chamber Orchestra of Europe, the oboist and conductor, just he must bring such a, a wealth to the uh, wealth of knowledge to the program and, and, and what you guys are going to be doing together, especially having performed together before. Um, so yeah. you'll be performing two Bach concerti. Yes. Uh, what can you tell us about those those two works? Uh, these are I'm playing the E major and then the D minor, and they're really extremely different pieces mm-hmm. of music. Um, I just came from San Francisco, where I was playing a program with four Bach concertos that I that I led from the keyboard, and these were two of them. So it'll be very interesting to do it with a conductor this mm-hmm. time. Um, the E major is, uh, well, one thing that I should say is that both concertos were also used by Bach in cantatas. Right. And so that's interesting that they share that in common. Um, and they both have extremely profound slow movements, um, where in the cantatas, they're in, in one of them, in the E major, there's a, a, a soprano who sings with it. And in the D minor, it's a choir that sings with it. <clears throat> um, so I think that that's interesting that Bach took music that has text and also used it as music without text. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, what I feel is that his music always says something very specific, even if it's even if there aren't any words to it. And uh, I recorded the D minor concerto a number of years ago with yeah, the back Staatskapelle, in right? yeah, in Berlin, yeah. and um, I remember that at that point I didn't know about that cantata, huh. and the concertmaster, uh, who was very schooled in 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 uh, Baroque music, he told me about it, and um, and it, I remember reading the words and thinking, of course, this is what I thought the music was saying anyway. You know, I didn't need the words to tell me that. Yeah. I I mean, uh, there's there's so much to the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, and that that D minor, the BWB 1052, is is definitely the more famous of the two. It's a very, very famous um, uh, keyboard work. Um, I'm curious, do they, in doing research for this, where these two works date from? They're back-to-back in the catalog, BWB 1052 Mm -hmm. and 1053. But are they from the same period in Bach's life? You're asking the wrong woman. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm just, I was just genuine. I was trying to figure it out and figure out if they place from the same oh. thing and if that might have something to do with the differences because they are very different works, right? Um, well, I mean, I well, first of all, I should know the answer to that. But then, uh, I mean, all of his music is so different. I mean, mm-hmm. you even take a piece of music like the Goldberg Variations, which, you know, he wrote in one you know period of time, mm-hmm. and each variation is, is entirely different than the other. So I think that that shows the the scope of his imagination. Um, 
the E major. Also, I think he he had a very particular sense about the character of a key. Mm-hmm. So works that he wrote in E major have a very different kind of sound and and uh, you know uh, emotional palette than those in D minor. Um, and uh, I find the E major particularly um, just joyful and sunny, which m- much of his E major music tends to be. Uh, of course, not the s- not the slow movement, which no. is is in contrasting. Minor. Yeah, yeah, yeah it so. contrasts. Um, I guess kind of the last thing I want to ask you. Um, again, in listening to our past conversation, uh, you described Bach as the perfect balance of mind and heart. Do you feel that in those in these two concerti as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah they just mm-hmm. kind of balance off one another, and and yeah. just that that idea of of a sort of structural unity and a, a relationship between soloist, between orchestra, between um, the singing voice, and how it perhaps motivates uh, the, the 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 keyboard part or or perhaps some of the orchestrations. Um, it should be a marvelous show, shouldn't it? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it very much. Well, I think we are looking forward to having you back in town. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time to come by Classic 107. Thanks. It was great talking. Simona Dinnerstein, Art of Baroque is the third concert in the Manitoba Chamber Orchestra season, which takes place tonight at Westminster United Church, 7.30 p.m. For more information, visit the mco.ca or classic107.com.